I'm going to ask all three of you to hang on just a minute because we have rather an incredible breaking news story that we're following right now. And this is coming to us out of Colorado. What you all see right there is an experimental aircraft that inside of which is a six-year-old boy who got into that aircraft not that long ago and accidentally launched it. It's hard to believe, but it is absolutely true. It's coming to us. Uh, this is the balloon. Uh, it is coming to us from KUSA. The chopper is taking pictures, and I believe this balloon, again, experimental with a six-year-old little boy whose parents have created this experimental balloon inside. It's about 10,000 feet up. That's the approximate height right now, traveling at pretty wicked speeds right there. This is in the area of Greeley, Colorado. The family home, I believe, is in Fort Collins, Colorado. So apparently this experimental balloon was attached somehow to the house of the family creating it. It was tethered by a rope and the six-year-old little boy got into that balloon and somehow detached the rope. There's a wider shot perspective, everybody. Imagine the terror right now of the six-year-old little boy and the family far away on the ground. Again, uh, estimates this being as high as 10,000 feet right now as it travels pretty quickly through the skies of Colorado. Uh, we don't have any information as to whether there is oxygen on board, whether there is anything other than this, I guess, very rudimentary basket uh, that is holding this six-year-old little boy. It's, it's an absolutely incredible story. As a matter of fact, when it crossed the wires, we had to double check all this to make sure it wasn't a hoax because it seems like just the most extraordinary story. But in fact, this is very true and something of a nightmare, not only for law enforcement on the ground, but the family of this boy. I don't even want to guesstimate how quickly this balloon is traveling uh, across. There were reports of sheriff's deputies uh, trying to keep pace with this balloon on the ground. Uh, have no idea if this little boy knows how to work this, how rudimentary the controls are, if there's any sort of steering mechanisms. It's an extraordinary situation right now. The FAA certainly monitoring this as, again, this is coming to us from KUSA, the helicopter, which at least is giving us uh, the good news, if you will, that this is staying aloft right now with this six-year-old six little boy inside. But if there are the mechanisms with which to land this experimental aircraft, experimental balloon, what have you, whether this six-year-old little boy is familiar enough to do that, whether this has been tested in any way, shape, or form, it is a frightening concept right now, especially if you look at the pitch right now of this. Um, it's not clear whether or not this is flying flat or whether it, it looks to be at something of a tilt. You've got to wonder what's inside of that basket or that, that appendage to the balloon that holds this six-year-old little boy. Again, these pictures are coming to us from KUSA. We're getting them right now on the fly. This is all live. And um, it, it's an extraordinary situation. No doubt the FAA is trying to track this. Um, it, uh, you, one can only imagine a six-year-old little boy at, at the helm of this, his parents on the ground looking around their home for that which had been worked on for some time, tethered to their home via what they no doubt presumed was a pretty strong rope with nothing like this in mind as they started to build this experimental balloon aircraft. It is like a horrific version of the movie Up that was released earlier this year in which there was a uh, unwitting passenger, the cartoon movie uh, of, a, of a young man on board or a, a young boy on, on board this house as it went up into the air. This is, uh, this is an extraordinary situation. Let's dip in right now into KUSA, our Denver affiliates coverage of this breaking news story. Take a listen, everyone. It looks like the helium is starting to vent or leak out of that uh, out of that balloon. So the, the big question is, how fast is it leaking? Because the other question becomes, if it is leaking and that is moving at 15 to 20 miles an hour, when it finally does come down, what's it going to hit? Whether it hits the ground, if it's flat, that's going to be a real rough ride for that young man. And then, of course, as it gets lower, you have to worry about it hitting obstructions like antennas or buildings or something to that effect. So even though the balloon may be coming down, 
there is still, and it's listing pretty good. You can see that uh, one side of it just from the pictures that uh, that are coming from Sky 9. Half of it uh, is starting to deflate. It, you know, uh, looks pretty good. So that could potentially cause a problem uh, when it finally hits the ground. Yeah, I think that's just the part that really is troubling to everyone knowing anyone following the story. So many of us have just been been scared and, and terrified the minute we heard that a child was involved here. And now, um, looking at those pictures, it looks like there oh. are some, it looks like, I don't know if that's a, a product of the photo, but it looks like there's a line hanging Ooh. down from that balloon. There is. It's a pretty, you know, like a 200 foot long line that, um, you know, I don't. I don't know if uh, if the military is going to try and get in there and, and, and snag that somehow, or are they, they're just going to follow it like uh, like Jimmy is. But you can tell that uh, that that balloon is really taking a, a bit of a beating right now with uh, with the wind. It's it's got a pretty good rotation rate. It's listing back and forth. Uh, so that's I think you know with Vaughn on the phone, you know <laughs> that's uh, I mean I would I, I would expect. And if you look at that rope whipping in the wind that's uh, I, I think that young man's in for a heck of a ride when uh, when he starts to get close to the ground and that's going to be the scary part there's actually it looks like two lines yeah that's what down. Marty Coniglio is sitting here saying yes he sees it as well Greg, I see those two those are obviously two of the tether lines and it makes you wonder if there is a possibility for gaining some kind of control of this aircraft while it's still in the air now uh, getting it to the ground uh, that's that's going to be an interesting uh, an interesting operation, but there may actually be a way, w as long as there's a tether, wouldn't you say, of, of somehow gaining control of this thing? I think, Marty, with with the military, the big the big concern of trying to get any kind of aircraft is they'd have to stay above it because you can't get a, uh, a helicopter in below it because it'll tend to suck the air and that machine or that balloon into the rotor system. So if the military was going to do something, they may put somebody down on a hundred foot long line underneath the helicopter, have them rappel out underneath the helicopter. It's been it's not been done in aircraft rescue like this before, but the military guys do rappel down lines from 100 feet when they're dropping into LZs or, or war zones and stuff. It may be that they could get creative and possibly get somebody on the bottom of a long line to, to try and capture one of those tether lines. Right. <sighs> Well, and again, um, as, as you mentioned before, and Vaughn has said as well, um, the best information is going to come from the boy's father in this case, because he is the one that built this aircraft, this device, and um, Adam Chodak is at the family's home, and, and we understand you've learned a little bit more, Adam. A deputy with the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. He told me that basically uh, what he thinks happened was they were uh, obviously building this uh, balloon, an experimental aircraft, and they were trying to test it, uh, trying to hover the uh, aircraft over the ground a certain feet, uh, a certain amount uh, over the ground. And the father had uh, knew the six-year-old was in there, but he thought that it was tethered to the ground at the time. This is all according to the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. Um, but as they were doing the hover testing, the balloon just continued to rise and took off beyond uh, the father's control because it wasn't tethered. We don't know why it wasn't tethered or how it came to be that way, but that's what the uh, sheriff's office is telling me right now. They are going to send over a public information officer uh, who could possibly give us some more information. The family is inside the home right now, we're told. Okay, course, everyone, as we continue emotional, to take the pictures being offered by KUSA, for... I want to bring in NBC's Tom Costello, who joins me from Washington. Tom is an AV aviation expert, one of ours uh, in residence one here. Um, so Tom, what do you think is the gravest situation here? Just, just as a mom, I've been watching this thing and the prospect of this helium balloon tipping over, it's come precariously close at points. And it looks so light, that balloon, were that to happen, what would happen? Yeah. It looks like the boy this would just fall through. 
This is just horrific, oh. uh, the scenario here. Let like me that, tell you, right I, there. Look I at that pitch. Per, here's my purse. Uh, it's awful. Let me tell you, I, I know this area well. I'm from Colorado, and I'm from Denver, and I used to work at the TV station you're listening to. Okay. Um, this, this is, if you see the mountains there in the background, there's a downslope wind that comes off the mountains and off onto the eastern plains. So you're not going to have a scenario, or at least it would be highly unlikely, that, the, that this particular balloon would float toward the mountains. It's more likely to stay on the eastern plains uh, in the Fort Collins to Denver area or perhaps even move further out east. And yet the problem is going to be, as Marty Coniglio, who is a meteorologist and works at KUSA mentioned, the problem is going to be how do you in any way try to intercept this balloon mm -hmm. because the vacuum, the sucking action of a helicopter okay. would rip it apart. Yep, Tom, hang on one second. The chopper file from KUSA is talking. Let's listen how we're shooting the pictures, not necessarily a function of how the aircraft is moving. Again, as Tim pans back out, you see that it's it's moving at a fairly steady rate. There, he pulled back more. It's moving smoothly. It's listing to one side. And again, you're getting an idea for how far away they are. So when we do zoom in, it looks very, very dramatic. And of course, out over some of the, the more rural expanses of what I would imagine now is Southern Wealth Can Oh my gosh, I bet that's I-76. Uh, I'm just I'm just talking from experience from and that looks like Bar Lake in the distance. I fly out in that area all the time. That looks like to me like that thing is passing uh, somewhere out around uh, Lock Bowie or Keensburg. Uh, and I'd love to hear from Tim or Jimmy in Sky Nine. Let us know exactly where they are. But that okay. sure as heck looks like I uh, said. As we continue to me, monitoring this, and Tom, I'll ask you to stand by. I want to bring in Susan Campbell, who is a hot air pilot. So Susan, as you look at this, we have a helium filled balloon losing helium an experimental aircraft here what is your gravest concern is it the landing well, clearly the landing. I mean, you know, safe flight is, is always better when you have some control. We don't know if he has any ballast on board, uh, but clearly the landing is going to be the most difficult to bring him down safely and uh, in an area where there are no obstructions like power lines. Okay. A six-year-old little boy is there, and as you say, we have no knowledge of the extent to which this family completed anything to give this child control, even if he were to know how to do it. If we're talking speeds of 15 to 20 miles an hour right now, which is what I heard from KUSA. Can you put that in perspective when you're coming down with also what appears to be two, about 200 foot long ropes attached? Well, it's just, it's just impossible to say, you know, depends on the, how, what the velocity of the winds, the direction of the winds, um, and just how, you know, what the winds are, especially when he comes in for a landing. Okay, um, Susan, by the makeup of what you're seeing, have you been able to look at what this contraption looks like? Yes, I'm okay. watching it also okay. on that, okay. uh, yeah. Okay, great. So you see it, I mean, how durable does it appear to you, This the, the basket the part, the, part, the passenger part? Well, I'm, I'm not a, a gas balloon pilot. I'm a hot air balloon pilot. You know, we're used to a traditional wicker basket construction, and I honestly can't tell from these pictures what the gondola is made of, so it's hard for me to uh, to speak to that. Okay, um, but you said uh, that it is good news, at least this is flying right now. If you look at the size of the balloon and the rate with which it has begun to deflate, is there any guesstimate as to how long we've got until this thing comes down? I certainly wouldn't want a hazard to guess. I mean, we're watching okay. something on TV that the perspective is really hard to guess. So uh, I Ten, really wouldn't like to speculate on that. How about this, Susan? Since you know hot air ballooning, 10,000 feet in the air at one point. We believe he is losing altitude at this point. But how difficult is it to breathe? At 10,000 feet, it's still okay. I mean, you still have oxygen up there, um, so that's not a problem. As he gets higher, you know, 13, 14,000 feet, that would be more difficult. But hopefully, if it's about 8,500 now, is that what they are saying, he should be fine in terms of oxygen. Okay, Susan, please stay with us. Tom Costello, I want to bring you in because you talked about that area topography uh, and the fact that there is this basin uh, adjacent to the mountains. This balloon is going back up now, it seems. The chopper pilot estimates estimates, Tom, that it's gone up to about an 8,500-foot elevation. These downdrafts, I mean, can you explain that again since you're from the area and you know the aviation community? 
boy, you know, the, the thing about the anybody who flies in and out of Denver knows that you are dealing with the winds coming off the mountains. Now, this time of year in Colorado, it's usually pretty calm. October's pretty calm. But um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm from that area, and the eastern uh, slope coming off the mountains uh, extends, uh, boy, you know, you could go all the way to Kansas. But the, the good news is because of the slope of the winds, because of the way the winds come off the mountains, it's unlikely, he, as I said, that he would be pulled over over the mountains. He's, he's more likely to hang out over the eastern plains, which is as flat as a pancake. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, of course, he's moving at such a clip that trying to keep up with him and, and follow him is going to be a real challenge. The last I heard as I was listening to them, and maybe we can dip back in, they were describing him as being over the Lock Bowie area. Well, that's, that is not anywhere near the Denver metro area. That is up in the northeastern or northern Colorado area. You know, you're, you're talking about near Fort Collins and east. So, uh, it's at that point you're flying away from metro areas, mm -hmm. not toward them. Okay. One let all of you know I'm getting word from one of our producers here that the National Guard is launching a helicopter. We're getting this from KUSA. Of course, there was some concern about the possibility of a helicopter because you can't approach this balloon from underneath. As we know, when those blades are circulating so quickly, that would create some sort of a, a, a sucking in effect of the wind, and you would not want to get anywhere close to that balloon and bring that downward so rapidly into those blades. So, of course, the National Guard is well aware of this, and I'm sure whatever chopper they are launching will be kept uh, at distance um, safely. That said, let's bring in NBC's hey, Lester Holt. Yeah, Tom? I, no, I was just going to suggest, I, I know you've got Lester there as well, but yep. you've got the KUSA helicopter pilot who's hovering next to it. It might be interesting to hear as well what he's saying about the dynamics here as well. Okay, I'll get the producers in the booth to get on that. And also, uh, you mentioned Lester Holt. Lester, let's talk about the altitude, the speed, uh, you being a pilot as well, and so familiar with all of this. Um, what are your biggest concerns as you watch this? I'm sure as terrified as the rest of us. Yeah, I am. And just to be clear, I'm an air, aircraft uh, uh, enthusiast. I'm not actually a pilot. I'm oh. watching this. I'm watching this. I've been in a hot air balloon. I understand ballast and that sort of thing. With helium, I would think there's got to be some kind of venting mechanism or something that was designed in this to allow it to descend. Whether a six-year-old child understands how that would be used mm -hmm. is unclear. Um, the other thing that I think of real concern right now is the airspace around the area. Um, there's probably not a transponder on this on this balloon, so the radar would be actually painting it uh, as probably a very small blip. They probably have a good idea where it is, but I would think, depending on where this is in relation to air lanes, that they are in touch with other aircraft, keeping them clear of commercial airplanes that might be flying along this route, uh, especially with you know, helicopters uh, flying around it. They'll be reporting the position, but that's, that's obviously a larger concern. Getting this child down is the biggest concern, and, and the altitude is, is a real worry because um, at some point, hypoxia could become an issue as you get up now into, into the, uh, uh, the, you know, up towards 14, 15,000 feet, not at that level right now. Yep. Also, the, as uh, Tom mentioned, the, uh, the rotors and winds coming off the mountains can affect it. Flying a chopper near this will be very, very risky um, because above it, uh, the downdraft can certainly affect the flight of the balloon. Below it, as you mentioned, there's this potential for a sucking action. There is no book written for something like this. Right now, someone is trying to write that book. There are people now going through all the possibilities and what to do. And I see it approaching the clouds here. Now, it's hard to get the perspective uh, for how close it is to the cloud cover, but that's another concern if they actually uh, lose sight of this. Yeah, you can about imagine. I know, uh, I, I will say, the only thing I can give perspective on this personally is I do climb mountains, and I've been up as high as 14 uh, plus thousand feet. And the oxygen, it, you can definitely feel it when you're up that high. And this child has been up, it estimated, at least 10,000 feet, if not higher yeah. at points, now at about 8,500. Also, unless we talk about the temperature. Well, it's going to be cold in there. One of the things I have done in preparation for a military flight, I went in the altitude chamber where they actually take you up to 25,000 feet and make you rip your oxygen mask off. Mm -hmm. And you get very stupid very quickly. Uh, you can't add two plus two. Um, right. the, the, effects, the effects of altitude are dramatic, and sometimes you don't feel them coming on. But it's going to be very cold where he is. I don't know how he is dressed. Even at the altitude he's at right now, it's going to be very cold and very uncomfortable. And, and we can only just imagine, imagine how frightening this is. 
this is for him. Yeah. Um, as I bring in Tom Costello again to the discussion, okay. Tom, right. um, we, we know that the balloon has been losing helium. Have you been able to, to get a look at that and see that perspective, how much you think has been lost? Because you've been following this for a bit with us. Tom? I'm sorry, Alex, you're talking? No, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. I had no, somebody that, in my ear. No, I, I, yeah. I can't give you any I can't give you any insight into how quickly it's losing helium. I can tell you that the FAA uh, contacted me as I, I contacted them and I asked, are you aware of the situation and what, if anything, are you doing about it? And the FAA's response was, we're aware of it and we're tracking it and we would love a good idea. Uh, they are also huh. very concerned about how you get this child out of the balloon. As for the weather, I talked to my brother in Denver today. It's supposed to be a nice day up in the upper 60s but of course when you're at uh, 10,000 feet it's a different story and you can only imagine how terrified that little boy is um, yeah. I've had kids that age and they certainly would not be capable of of uh, you know controlling the, the the mechanisms of a balloon certainly in not a situation like that and certainly for not this amount of time as I bring back Susan Campbell right now a hot air hot air balloon pilot Susan you heard some of the concerns to the point that the FAA says hey you got any good ideas you heard Lester Holt as well saying right now the book is being written on how to deal with a situation like this can you offer any insight based on being a hot air balloonist as to the best course of action well, we're actually trying to contact two of our friends who are gas balloonists or helium pilots, uh, trying to get a hold of them to see if they have ideas. Clearly, you know, there's a big difference between flying with an airborne heater like a hot air balloon has and the uh, flight that this helium balloon is. They have much less control. We at least have control over our altitude by venting the, you know, the air or, or heating it up. So uh, we're in touch with, we're, I'm trying to get in touch with two of our uh, helium pilots to see if they have any better ideas. I mean, the only hope we have is to have this thing descend into slower winds with the the, the uh, ropes that are on the bottom maybe they would be able to have a controlled landing but uh, I, I you know I think we're all trying to brainstorm and figure out what's the best thing to do here but the winds are the biggest key and how quickly it cools okay all right uh, Susan Campbell will ask you to stay with us and and if you get any ideas from those uh, helium balloon specialists and pilots that you've spoken with we'd appreciate your insights and I'm sure anybody listening on an official level would appreciate that as well. Uh, so for all of you just joining us, I want to let you know what you're looking at. That is not a flying saucer. In fact, that is a very bad emergency situation right now over the skies of Denver, Colorado. Inside that experimental helium balloon aircraft is a six-year-old little boy, the son of the people who designed this aircraft in Fort Collins, Colorado. They had this aircraft tethered aside their home. Reports from KUSA suggest they were doing some sort of testing the father may have been aware that his six-year-old son was inside somehow believing that the two sturdy ropes that kept this helium balloon attached to the ground became unattached and since then it has been an odyssey of epic proportions as NBC's Lester Holt suggested just a short while ago they are writing the book on how to deal with this this experimental helium balloon has been going through the air at speeds of about 15 to 20 miles an hour that's an approximation wildly vacillating with uh, the air altitude between say 8,500 feet maybe as high as 10,000 feet we believe if you look right now you can get a perspective on the side of the balloon it looks as if it is losing some of its ballast there losing some helium it may be seeping out and that will of course cause that experimental aircraft to come down to earth the gravest concern is how to land this safely with a six-year-old little boy inside. I'm Alex Witt covering this breaking news. I'm going to hand everything over now to my colleague Tamron Hall. Tamron. Incredible job, Alex, on a story we've never seen before. Thank you very much. Also with me this hour, of course, uh, is my colleague David Schuster in Washington, D.C. We're watching this play out and hoping to get more information from the FAA as well as NORAD, David, who says it is aware of the situation like the FAA. They are monitoring it. I think that Lester Holt, our colleague at NBC, had the best words. No book has been written on how to handle this situation. And that book is being written, so to speak, right now. We're going to go to KUSA, their live coverage of this as we watch uh, what, what is a scramble at this point to try and save what is believed to be a six-year-old boy. According to his parents, he is inside this helium balloon. Let's listen to KUSA's live coverage. Leak, which would hopefully bring it down 
you know, more controlled than sooner. Well, yeah, and it's the time. It's the time now. We're already talking. This, we're, our best guess is that this um, this aircraft took off about 11 a.m., mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so we're already two hours into it. It's traveled a good deal uh, distance. It was in in Fort Collins. It was Collins, in the southwest side of Fort Collins, so and here we are. We're talking about northeast of Hudson. Yeah, we're about Hudson by now. So the wind has carried it. Now, as it goes farther south, the winds aloft are lighter. So it should slow down. And as Greg was just mentioning, we, we have it highlighted, uh, the general area where we believe the balloon to be at this time, out near Hudson and Keensburg, north and east of DIA. You can see DIA is right there. Uh, it's in the L of location, the word location that we have there. So we're north and east of Lock Bowie, out near Keensburg. And we do, we have no reason to believe that the balloon's going to move any other direction other than to the south and east, which would take it out of Weld County and then over into extreme eastern sections of Adams County, which again is a, a lot of rural areas. And, and my estimation is, by based on what I saw upper air this morning, that it would in fact start to slow down the farther to the south that it goes and the, the farther to the east that it goes. But that's still 15 miles an hour. And Kim, you just pointed out, we're two hours in. Well, if we have another eight hours to go, a six year old child, you're, you're, six -year -old child you're talking about potentially another 90 to 100 miles. And the temperature and the altitude. And yes, and so there is, uh, there, there's a lot to consider. Uh, uh, be very interested to see if the National Guard decides to do anything or if they're just going to go up and monitor. I, I, Greg, as Greg said, I'm Greg, you, you'll tell us they don't have one in the manual for this. No, they don't. It's, uh, it's going to be, you know, seat of the pants trying to figure out what would be the best and uh, and safest option. Do we know, Marty, uh, based on uh, what you've looked at as far as the forecast, if the cloud deck remains, you know, I mean, you, I think you were saying that it's what, 35 or 4,000 feet AGL? Yes, above, um, above ground level, yes. And so it, do those clouds remain that high all the way out to the eastern plains or does it look like the weather gets better or worse the uh, further you go? And we continue, of course, to listen to our coverage from our affiliate in Denver, KUSA, as this uh, helium balloon drifts to the southeast. Uh, Tamron, one important point that we should uh, make here, and that is if you look at the direction from where this balloon started several hours ago in Fort Collins and right. you were to draw a line to the location they were just talking about, which is Hudson, Colorado, it's to the southeast and it is not not that far north from Denver International Airport. Right. You heard the references in the uh, by the helicopter pilot to DIA, Denver International Airport. And again, we're talking to Route 76 to the north. So would we presume that when Tom Costello was talking earlier about having to reroute some of the traffic that is going into DIA, that is a real concern because sometimes if you're making from a north to the south landing, you would essentially go right over mm -hmm. Hudson, Colorado. Yes, David, and we know that the FAA, NORAD, uh, all of these agencies are are trying to figure out what to do. Tom Costello joins us, as you mentioned. And Tom, that is the reality at this point. As Lester and you've mentioned, there's no book written on what to do in this situation. What do we know or what have you heard from the FAA? I know you contacted them. I did, and the FAA uh, said they're very much aware of it, very concerned about it. The tower at DIA, as you might expect, is monitoring the situation. Denver International Airport is one of the 10 busiest airports in the country. And as David mentioned, there's a good deal of traffic in and out of the eastern plains of Colorado, in and out of DIA. Uh, at the moment, if this is, in fact, traveling at 15 miles per hour, and if they're over the area of Hudson right now, it sounds like they're going to drift away from DIA. But uh, listen, any gust could put it back into that DIA uh, flight area. Uh, we have not heard at this point of any uh, flight issues, restrictions in or out of DIA, but you can be assured that they're watching it. If the plane is at 4,000 feet above the ground, uh, then that presumably, and they have a very good fix on it, presumably uh, air traffic could avoid, avoid it. Now, you may be asking, well, how do we bring it down? Right. Do you shoot it with a BB gun? Do you bring in a helicopter? What do you do? Well, all of those post, pose very serious risks when you've got a six-year-old inside. On the other hand, uh, you're, there's also a great deal of concern about the health of that child being exposed to the temperature right there at 4,000 feet above the ground. It's 68 degrees in Denver today, more or less, but that certainly is not the temperature at 4,000 feet above the ground. And the concern, as you heard them mention, the KUSA people mentioned, uh, that this may go on for eight hours based on how much helium is in that, plane, in that, in that balloon. This is a real, real concern about rescuing this child in 
in, in, in a scenario that no one has ever planned for before. Well, uh, Tom, uh, hang on for a second. We want to bring back Lester Holt, uh, who is an aviation enthusiast. And Lester, talk to us about the conditions that the child might be experiencing at this point while inside this uh, experimental uh, aircraft. Well, we should be clear for folks they keep hearing 4,000 versus 10,000 feet. When we, when we talk about 10,000, that's above sea level in my New York, Colorado. So it's about 4,000 feet above ground level right now. But you're still feeling the effects of being 10,000 feet above sea level, which is breathable air. It's going to be colder up there than, uh, than down on the ground. Um, and the concern, obviously, if he goes higher, then it becomes more difficult to breathe. Right now, that doesn't seem to be a threat. The threat now is, as Tom has been noting, it continues to move off in the same direction at 15 miles an hour. I think you had reported a bit earlier that uh, the National Guard was scrambling a helicopter. We shouldn't read too much into that. We shouldn't necessarily read, uh, you know, James Bond heroics. They are likely putting up a chopper, if nothing, if for no other reason, to effect a rescue or recovery once once this uh, balloon goes down. That's got to be the forefront of their mind. In terms of figuring out how to bring it down, my guess is we're not even close to that right now. Uh, because there are so many uh, variables, not only the safety of the child, but the safety of any helicopter crew or anyone who would be involved in this sort of dramatic rescue. Uh, watching this, I can't help but, but think back to the um, to the Payne Stewart flight of many years ago, yeah. that, that plane in which yeah. everyone was overcome and the plane continued to fly on. Now, we have every reason to believe that, that the boy is fine in this situation, but there's that same helpless feeling of watching something, and we are all conditioned to believe that everything has a solution everything can be fixed that we can rescue anyone but right now there are a lot of very very smart people who are who are trying to work this problem as quickly as they can uh, but never have we been confronted by something like this and it's even difficult for those of us even somewhat familiar with balloons it doesn't even look like a balloon you really can't see a gondola per se or understand exactly what the child is in or whether he has any view out of the vehicle um, helium balloons gas balloons you very often have a, a an emergency vent, a rope, if you will, that you would pull uh, that would quickly vent it. That would primarily be used on landing, perhaps to keep it from blowing along the ground. Uh, I'm not sure what the effect would be if he were to pull that in flight at this altitude or whether he has the wherewithal um, to attempt to vent or pull anything. Uh, we simply don't know what the shape of this balloon Lester, was. Lester, are you watching your screen? We're going to bring in Dr. Nancy, but we just saw a, a drop there uh, with yep, the watching. balloon. We've seen that, Tom and Lester throughout this uh, two hours uh, that it's been going on. But what's happening there likely? Chairman, I think I can I can actually answer that. It's it's actually what the what the helicopter is doing when you monitor the transmissions is that it's the helicopter itself, the KSA helicopter is changing its position okay. relative to the helium balloon, which gives it the appearance that either the balloon is going up or down. But we do believe that the, the balloon is on a straight sort of southeast uh, position, which could eventually take it towards Bennett, Colorado, towards Byers. So again, we, we do believe that the, the sort of up and down is reflective of the helicopter camera shooting this, not the balloon itself. Uh, but but Tamara, one thing that, uh, and again, to clarify for, uh, for all of our viewers, we're still working on more information about exactly how uh, this balloon was built and, and what the family was trying to do and, and exactly what happened that caused this thing to be untethered with the boy. And as we get more information, we will update our viewers on that. But let's go ahead and bring in uh, Dr. Nancy Snyderman. And Dr. Snyderman, we're talking again about a balloon that is between eight to 10,000 feet. Um, obviously, the temperature is a concern, but what are your immediate concerns as far as this boy's health and what he may be experiencing right now? Now. Well, between six, six to 10,000 feet, some people will start to experience some kind of air sickness. Usually it's nausea and headache. It's really above 10,000 feet mm. where you really start to feel the lack of oxygen. And that can be headache, you know, changes in decision making. But in this case, when you have someone who's, you know, passive and not having to make really make decisions, it may not have as much of a bearing. It's obviously quite cold. Children under the age of two more at risk. But for a six-year-old, other than the fright and a little bit of thinning of oxygen and the, the, um, the change in temperature, not so much of a risk. But again, if he goes above 10,000 feet, then things change. 
Nancy, as far as uh, I mean, the emotional state and the psychological state, there could be a certain point at which uh, the boy might be, I don't know, depending on if, if the miraculous were possible and if it was possible to drop somebody from a helicopter towards that balloon, uh, at, at a certain point the boy might be called upon to either reach out or, or, or to provide some sort of cooperation. Uh, take us through the, the mind of, a, a, of anybody, but especially a young child in the midst of uh, very dire circumstances like this. I mean, assuming you could over, you know, hear over the wind, and if you've ever gone parasailing, you know it's not a sort of a passive sound, that the roar of the wind is really ferocious. So how you would communicate and how you would hear directions, boy, I don't know how that would happen at all. But from a cognitive standpoint, um, if you could hear being able to make decisions, being able to follow directions, between six to 10,000 feet, that should become possible. The biggest difference is breathing rapidly just from the sheer fright of it, and then the change in oxygen concentration, breathing can become a little more um, labored. But if this child are in fact in otherwise decent condition, he should be able to follow direction. Well, Nancy, that's what I wanted to follow up with you. You were talking with David about uh, the effects of loss of oxygen, and this being a six-year-old child, an adult would be panicked in this. So if he is panicked in a situation like this, how might the difficulties of, of the, the level, the altitude start to affect him? I mean, we're assuming, certainly, he's been around this aircraft, but I, I would assume not alone, and certainly, we know not in a situation like this. You know, the biggest concern is whenever you're caught in a perilous situation, you tend to hyperventilate. Yeah. And when you breathe really rapidly, you expel, uh, um, you change oxygen and carbon dioxide really quite readily, and you almost become lightheaded. If you combine that rapid breathing with a change in oxygen, um, you know, it's it's possible that things are a little blurry and foggy, but I, I there's no reason for me to think that he's passed out or right. lost consciousness at this uh, altitude. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Nancy. And David, I'm sure you just got this note in as well. Uh, Denver International Airport has not issued a ground stop at this time. Uh, they are monitoring the situation, and KUSA has a press conference. Let's listen in. Got her eye on it also. Kathy, who is the family and how are they doing? The family is uh, Miami and Richard Haney, and they are very upset. This balloon was never meant to actually carry anybody. It was just a family project they were working on, and it's the little compartment where their son is in is very small, and it's not attached very well. Did they say at all how the balloon became untethered and took off? No, they didn't. I know they've got uh, two boys. The boys were both playing outside. Uh, the family was in the house, the rest of the uh, family, and the one son saw the little brother go inside the little compartment and watch it take off. Do we know for sure if uh, Falcon is inside the basket right now? He is. And what is the family doing at this point? Are they watching uh, this unravel on TV? Well, no, there's um, some agencies that are familiar with this type of experiment that are talking to the family on the phone, giving them ideas and finding out how this balloon was made so that they've got information on what to do when it does come to the ground. Kathy, we know the family are experienced weather chasers in the summer months. Did you talk about that at all? And is that what this balloon was intended for? I don't know that. Possibly. Do you have any information about what Falcon may be wearing as far as clothes to keep him is he cold up there do you have an indication of that no i don't okay no, any idea about time. what he's wearing um i not at this time okay do we know were they doing an experiment we had heard earlier that they had been uh, having the balloon hover over the ground a little bit possibly uh, I, I can't confirm that right now yeah. and uh, that, how is the family is the family uh able to give information or, or are they just uh, too distressed? No, they are. They're able to give information. Like I said, uh, uh, Richard is talking on the phone with different agencies that, that are involved with this type of experimentation. Do you know, do you know how high um, the balloon reached at all? Do you have any information? No, that I don't. Yeah, but it's, it's pretty high. Kathy, I understand Cooter School District was off today for elementary students. Is that why Falcon was at home? Probably, I believe so. Did the father know Falcon was mm -hmm. in the basket when it took off? No, because um, he was in the house. The son is the one that came in and told him that the brother had climbed in the basket when it took off and watched it go up.
Kathy, as we look at the house behind you, it's not a big lot. Where was this balloon? The backside in the driveway? It is. The backyard's not very big. Um, probably on the left side when you go out the back. All right, well, thank you very much for the update. You're welcome. Heather. And again, that was the update from the Larimer County uh, Sheriff's Office. And Chairman, we, uh, we got a couple of things confirmed there. Yeah. We got the name of the family. Uh, yeah. It's the Haney family. Uh, Richard Haney is the father who was inside. Uh, there's actually um, a, a search reveals that he is a storm chaser who has been quoted in uh, articles uh, chasing tornadoes and storms when there are articles written about that. The son's name is Falcon. Uh, the family says and the sheriff says Falcon was definitely inside. It was right. also, Chairman, fairly um, troubling to hear that the, the bottom part of that uh, contraption is not, according to the sheriff, not very well connected right. to the top. Uh, so that's obviously of, of great concern. David, I want to bring in Susan Campbell. She's a hot air balloon specialist. Obviously, this is a helium balloon, but she has uh, in, been in contact or trying to get in contact with pilots familiar with this kind of aircraft. So, Susan, thanks for sticking around with us. We're watching this, and as David pointed out, what may appear to be uh, movement, up and down movement with this uh, experimental aircraft is perhaps we're watching the helicopter that's following, but we do see it turn uh, different directions there. What, what do you think we're observing here with this uh, a helium balloon? Well, at this point, I, I, the pictures I'm looking at does look like they're losing more helium at a more rapid rate is what I'm noticing here. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, losing more helium, and, and if that's the case, it's going to start coming down even faster. And it's estimated that this, uh, air, this experimental aircraft is going about 15, 20 miles per hour right now. Have you been able to get in contact with, I heard you say earlier, you're trying to talk with uh, some pilots who uh, operate these gas balloons or helium balloons? Yes, and I've been able to get a hold of neither of the two gentlemen I'm trying to get a hold of right now. So um, that's unfortunate because, uh, you know, clearly they have more experience with gas than we do. How is this different from uh, being in a hot air balloon, which is your specialty? Well, with a hot air balloon, you have an onboard heater that you can actually put propane in to uh, warm the air to ascend. You have a vent where you can let air out to uh, come back down. And so you have control of your vertical altitude. In th well, this type of balloon is, is certainly no gas balloon I've ever seen, but traditional helium balloons also have a way to, you know, put ballast out or to, you know, uh, as the sun warms the uh, helium, you go up, and as it cools, it goes at night. So there is some control and you have ballast from this aircraft it doesn't appear that um, he has that type of control and that's what's most disconcerting uh, you know I don't know what type of control the aircraft right. has and then a six-year-old trying to or if he would even be able to it. do it yes exactly Susan we want to get you to hang on for a second I know David's got somebody for us for, to talk to David yeah Tamara we're getting these pictures from uh, KUSA our affiliate uh, in Denver and on the phone with us now is one of their producers Nicole Vatt and uh, Nicole I understand that you have some new information what do you have uh, we have just learned that life flight is on the way to the scene, um, to the area where this is all happening. This is happening. Um, well, first of all, Nicole, explain what Life Flight is for viewers who are not familiar with it. Life Flight is a helicopter service that uh, goes to scenes of accidents, will take people if they're injured, and fly them to a local hospital. Okay. Now, do you, does your station have any more information about the uh, precise location of the balloon uh, as it uh, is floating now? The last time, about five minutes ago, was 15 miles south of uh, DIA, Denver International Airport. If you are familiar with the Denver area, uh, Denver International Airport is outside of town, northeast of town in kind of a rural area, um, and so that's where he is right now, just past Did you that. say 15 miles to the south of yes. Denver International Airport? Yes, south, and it's heading east, so it's southeast. It's probably about 20 miles now. It seems to be going pretty quick, you know, fast uh, in the air. The, you know, the winds are pretty high right now. Um, they're about 24 miles an hour coming out of the northwest, and with gusts up to 30 miles an hour, so he's getting a pretty good wind uh, pushing him along. Okay, then for the the map that we're showing now, then that's going to be uh, wrong because if it's to the south, if you draw a line, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Nicole, if you draw a line from Fort Collins to Denver International Airport, that's much more of a southerly sort of line than an easterly. In other words, much more to the south than to the east and would put it as almost as if, I suppose, the line looks like it, it, the, the, the craft may have traveled essentially from Fort Collins a lot closer to Denver than uh, than a lot of us have realized. It's a, what were, yeah, it's pretty close to Denver actually, but 
right. It's, it's going along I-76, which is, you know, one of the main uh, highways that goes out of, of Denver uh, towards, say, Sterling, Colorado. And so that's where it's, it's you can see, um, yeah, there, it's near Hudson. I'm looking at your map right now. It's near Hudson, Colorado, which, uh, you know, is, is northeast of, of the Denver area. David, we still have Susan and uh, Lester Holt. Susan, you see what's happening here. You see the tethers there, and it appears that the, as you pointed out, helium may be leaving rapidly from this aircraft. Give us some insight on what we're watching. Well, again, it's hard to tell from this point of view, but, uh, you know, it's clear that helium is leaving at a, at a quicker rate. Um, he'll be descending more quickly, and um, um, it, this is, you know, I don't know how much longer he'll stay in the air, but clearly this thing is uh, not going to be in the air for hours and hours. Have you seen Susan, any aircraft similar to the one we're looking at, Susan? Never. <laughs> no, Susan, not if it at is all. losing... If it is losing helium in the, in the way it is, in other words, out of one part of it, um, could that conceivably cause this to sort of tip over and more and, and, and sort of be even more slanted over? I mean, uh, explain the aerodynamics. If part of the balloon essentially deflates and the helium remains in another part, would that ne by necessity cause it to, uh, to dip? It certainly depends on the design of this aircraft, and I have no idea how the inside is, even whether there's baffling in there or not. So uh, it's hard to what say is, uh, not baffling? knowing the design. Explain what, what, what is the bath, what are you referring well, if, to right Well, if it there? were sectioned, if it were sectioned off uh. in different helium compartments, but it's, I just don't know that from looking at it. All right, we've also uh, got with us, David, Jim Cantori from the Weather Channel. Uh, Jim, give us some uh, description of the weather conditions there now where this is. Well, you know, it really depends on how far up he is or down. I mean, if he's at 3,000 feet, he's, he's, if you will, at a temperature where it's probably 40 degrees. If he's up around 7,000 feet, he's below freezing right now. So that's a whole different story uh, with the weather. The temperature typically decreases with height in the standard atmosphere. You can see behind me this water vapor image showing the jet stream is moving from northwest to southeast. And the level that he appears to be at right now where winds are blowing at about 30, 35 miles per hour, possibly even faster than that. 45 miles an hour. The good news is, at least at this point, if there's any good news in this, that we're not seeing the balloon, it doesn't appear like go up. The cold, the higher it goes up, the worse the wind is going to be, number one, and also the colder the temperatures are going to be. Now, the big question is how much uh, can we sustain this helium? And obviously, what is a very aerodynamic helium balloon uh, that just continues to move along at, at a pretty great speed? So, temperature goes down the farther you go up, and wind speeds go up as well. The good news is, if we can continue to see this slowly, slowly drop, maybe, maybe there'll be some miracle that awaits this guy uh, as he get closer closest to the ground but right now uh, he's pretty much at the mercy of the jet stream which is blowing from northwest off to southeast and he's working its way over Can eventually over Kansas what about Back the wind gusts we just heard uh, from the uh, reporter David was speaking with well, you know, it, it seems that there are disturbances. There's a disturbance around that's coming over the mountains right now. Uh, you can see some cloud buildup over the mountains. Uh, it doesn't appear to be a very strong disturbance, but you know, you're, you're at a point in the day where the sun, still strong enough this time of the year, can mix the air up to a level where you can get what we call eddies, you know, or, or mixing of the air. So that could certainly be a possibility. Winds can be stronger in those eddies. They can go calm for a moment. But you know, if, if, again, it just really depends on what level he is at right now. If we are are going to determine exactly what that wind is but just looking at the pictures and looking at, at the speed he appears to be moving along uh he's up there certainly in some sustained winds at least at 30 miles an hour all right and david from this vantage point we get a closer look at that attachment we heard in that newser uh david that the family says that that attachment that compartment on the bottom where the child is is not secure it is not something that they plan anyone to get inside and it's not yeah. attached very well that was the quote from the news conference yeah, and Tamron, I, I wonder if we still have uh, Susan Campbell. I think I've, I've got a question sort of related to that. And, and Susan, are you still there? Yes. Susan, it w would it make any difference in terms of the aerodynamics if uh, Falcon, the six-year-old, is moving around in that little sort of basket uh, enclosure Tamron was just talking about? Um, does it affect the dynamics if he shifts his weight around? I mean, could the sort yes. of the, the dipping we see, could that be relative to the boy's actions? Yes, it could be, and especially on landing. You know, in a hot air balloon, when you come in on landing, um, you, you kind of want to get to the back of the balloon, you know, away from the direction you're traveling, because if you're going to hit, you know, you want to be in the back in case you get thrown forward. So, you know, I, I don't even know if he can see out of that thing. But, you know, you, ideally, it, when it comes into land, he'd kind of like to be in the back end of it so he's got room to move and, and can, can deal with the, uh, the drag. But as it, it could definitely be him moving around in there. And is there a possibility of this essentially flipping upside down depending on the aerodynamics? 
I think there's always that possibility. It's just hard to see it, depending on how much uh, helium comes out uh, before he's able to, uh, you know, come to the ground. All right. And David, we're just getting word, uh, and we mentioned this a bit earlier, but the Colorado National Guard Joint uh, Operations has accepted the mission from the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center to launch a helicopter in an effort to rescue the child in there. What their plan is, we do not know, but this is another detail coming in at this point on uh, any rescue efforts. We have people emailing and even calling us. What are the options? But I think Lester Hull, David, put it very well. No book has been written on how to bring this down, and Lester is still with us at this point. Lester, what strikes you most by what we're watching here now in the two-hour mark, I believe, of this uh, odyssey? Well, it appears to be getting lower, which is, 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 is both gratifying and also frightening because we don't know how it's going to come down. But as I was watching this, uh, Tamarin, I think any uh, military veterans, people who follow the military closely, will probably be thinking of something called the Fulton Recovery System. It was developed in the 60s, and basically it was a way to retrieve downed air crew in which they would launch a helium balloon along a rope. That rope would go about 400 feet up. A C-130 with almost like a, like a scissors-like device would come and snatch that rope, lift them off the ground, and winch them safely into the airplane. I'm seeing the lines attach to this balloon, and the thought crossed my mind. I did a little checking. Unfortunately, that system, the Air Force stopped using it in the late 90s, but I'm sure it has crossed the minds of a lot of people with military experience who are probably thinking, you know, could they do something similar with this system, actually grab those lines with a C-130, probably not uh, at, the, at this late hour, and certainly as we see this uh, balloon continue to lose helium. One thing to caution, because we're watching this in a helicopter shot, the helicopter's moving around, he's on a very long lens, is we get a distorted sense of movement here. Um, it appears to be moving much quicker than 15 miles an hour, but even that, obviously a very fast speed as we see it begin to oscillate now in that side-to-side -side movement. We can only imagine what it's like inside, especially if the child doesn't have any visibility, there's no window or, or porthole to see. And watching the helium uh, that's, been, that's been apparently escaping there, the other thought that came to my mind was whether the child is manipulating anything on here, any controls or any venting, uh, pulling at cords, and perhaps contributing to that in some form or fashion. And lastly, something I didn't hear in the news conference was whether there was any kind of radio or phone or anything on this uh, this craft, this balloon, that they, that they might be able to try and get a hold uh, of the child. Those are the things that, that have crossed my mind. You know, Lester, I, I want to ask you about, you know, with all the um, the years of reporting that you've had on, on aircraft and, and I think even some storm chasers, it, it appears that this family, Richard Haney and his wife, Mayumi, and their boys, I mean, they're all talked about in a number of uh, articles about storm chasers and interest in uh, GPS systems and weather balloons. Is it is it all possible, uh, and this is obviously pure conjecture on our part, that, uh, that maybe the boy is perhaps more comfortable with the situation than we think just because of his family's interest in these types of uh, aircraft? Craft? Well, I mean, I think you have to allow, if, if the family was working on something like this, he was around it, then yeah, he would probably be at, at least perhaps a better understanding of the technology than the rest of us. Um, but that doesn't mean certainly he was prepared to, to go it along on an out-of-control ride. Um, but, he would, but, the, but there's a nugget there where he said that he might at least have some knowledge of, of the controls inside and maybe seen you know, Dad working with them, maybe have some sense. Of, of, of how this thing works and just not able to really control it. Well, Lester, we've got uh, Tom Costello and David. Tom Costello is still with us now. Tom, have you heard an update at all from the FAA or any of these agencies uh, now following this? Uh, the FAA has, uh, what, the last time I had a conversation with them, they just said to me, as I mentioned earlier, we're still looking for good ideas here. And as, as we understand, the uh, Colorado National Guard is now talking about possibly trying to hoist a rescuer uh, down to that balloon from a helicopter above. But this is, uh, you know, as, as Lester said, they, this is unprecedented. I, you know, I got to be concerned, as, as you have expressed this already, you got to be very concerned about how cold it is inside that that aircraft and and yes they're at 4,000 feet above the ground 10,000 above sea level um, but uh, you know Colorado is a dry climate and uh, being a, a native Coloradan uh, you know it gets cold there very quickly I'd be concerned about that as well um, and the other concern that the uh, that they are watching very closely it's hard to tell if this is if it's actually dropping or if this is the helicopter uh, moving its position to give you a sense of what's happening to the balloon but the other concern I was going to say is um, you know with the proximity is to DIA 
FAA to Denver International Airport. We've talked about that from time to time, but that has to be a continuing ongoing concern. All right. Okay, uh, we've got a reporter on the ground, KUSA, our affiliate, Tom and uh, Lester and David. Let's listen in to what they are saying right now. Obviously, it's skewed in perspective because of Sky right. 9 and the movements of the helicopter. So, Brian, you're telling us that it's, it's not moving, it's not moving in a straight line direction, but it's beginning to circle above you? Yeah, it's definitely circling. Um, and again, it looks, it, it's a, really a very interesting thing. It looks like a, a flat from the ground up. Um, looks like a mushroom just floating there. Um, very flat. Looks like one of the sides has uh, definitely deflated at this point compared to the other side. Yeah. Now, you can see the building like there in perspective. Brian, see. apologize for interrupting you. We want to let folks know this, uh, this balloon uh, has, has dropped significantly, mm -hmm. now being estimated at an uh, elevation of 500 feet. And uh, we're watching it descend now. We want to let folks know that, that as the balloon starts to come down and nears the ground, that's not something that we are going to right. uh, be showing people live until we're we're certain that the child inside is safe. That's not something that you're going to watch live here on the air. We, we want to be cautious as this and, plays and out. This is a story right now that has attracted national attention. There have been calls from news outlets, actually worldwide attention from all over to, to our newsroom as well. It's, it's, I'm watching the Associated Press news wires and they are following this. We've had calls from Australia. Okay, and as of we can course, see, the reporting there from KUSA is that this thing has dropped down now to 500 feet, which would mean that it has lost a several thousand feet in just the last 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, there's more information that's coming out about the uh, Haney family, um, including this that uh, suggests that they devote their time to scientific experiments that include looking for extraterrestrials, according to one dispatch, and building a research gathering flying saucer. There's even one uh, account that suggests that they believe in psychics uh, and that um, they can somehow, that the psychics can somehow control the weather. So um, whether or not these websites and what they're saying is an accurate depiction of the yeah. family. Yeah. There are a number of quotes from the family supporting some of this, so it's certainly uh, an unusual family, to say the least. Well, David, let's bring back uh, Susan uh, Campbell. She is the uh, balloonist uh, expert here. Susan, we see that one side deflated there, 500 feet. Uh, what do you believe are the scenarios here as far as what, what kind of landing we could see? Well, um, you know, with the winds on the ground, uh, it's going to be a uh, higher wind landing. At the drag. First of all, hitting something, an obstruction like a power line, is an issue that we want to avoid. And if they're able to avoid that, there will be some dragging involved until the balloon deflates all the way. So um, if it were to get close to the ground and hit something and deflate rapidly, um, it's kind of good if it doesn't drag a long way because the dragging could also come, you know, cause injury. But the first thing I'd, I'd be worried about are power lines or obstructions. And we've seen several power lines in this uh, shot. Uh, Perspective-wise, we're seeing uh, what appears to be uh, this movement closer to the homes as well as those power lines. David, I think you have someone with an update for us as well. Yeah, Eloise Campanella, she's with the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. And Eloise, first of all, what do you know about what we're seeing on TV right now? Do you actually have resources in the area where this balloon appears to be coming down? Uh, we have resources on the ground and in the air at this time. Uh, we were lucky to get the assistance of uh, some of the helicopters out of the Denver news stations. But it is now in Adams County at this time. It is heading south. Um, I am told that it's down to about 900 feet right now. Um, we are very much concerned about the... All right, it's going down okay, it's now. Going I'm going to cut you off because it's yes. actually going down. It's down to 300 okay. and now 100 according yes. to the okay. helicopter. What yes. we're going to do... Is, uh, Alrighty, there you for go. our viewers, we're going to uh, put this on a delay, and we're um, we're not going to show the moment of impact here. Uh, but clearly, it's going down. It, by all accounts, there are uh, Tamron, there are fire and rescue. In fact, yes. you can see something right there. And if this thing floats down a little bit slower the way it was going, this might David, be okay. It just landed. It has just landed. We see a gentleman rushing, literally trying to cradle, cap, capture the bottom attachment. Uh, this is a, a field, some kind of field. It was a softer landing, I think, than anyone certainly thought it, It's when we started carrying this earlier. Susan, let me get you in here. What, what, are, we, what are we seeing here for this oh, landing? I can't imagine a better scenario. A soft plowed field, no power lines, a gentle descent, people there to catch him. This is a very wonderful ending, I think, too, as long as he's okay inside. But, boy, you couldn't ask for a better outcome. How incredible is that? Lester, you're still with us. We were talking about power lines. We saw houses in the horizon and now an open field. And we're waiting to see any uh, 
signs of what may be going on inside the attachment, but what do you, what do you perspective-wise think of this landing we just witnessed? Well, you, you, what you couldn't hear is my audible sigh uh, <laughs> uh, watching this come down. I think I ours, think our, too. I think everyone. All of our heart, hearts were beating here. Uh, um, this this is, is the best possible outcome. Well, up to, up to the point where we find out he's okay, but in terms of the, the best possible landing um, scenario, um, to, to watch it float down like that, and I think you know we're also a little tense here now in these next few moments to to see if they're able to reach him. Um, Lester, is there but, a danger but, uh, with the helium? Is that, is that I mean, is there anything that concerns them about actually opening up the balloon? I mean, it would seem like they're standing back a distance. Is there something they have to do to either yeah, that, ground it or? It, yeah, you do. You just you just got out of my expertise there. I really I really don't know. I don't know. They seem to be trying to dig around mm -hmm. it right now as best that I can tell to get to the, the problem is it's, it's not a typical balloon in which you have a gondola, so it's unclear where he is and, and right. i'm glad to see someone now finally getting that rope around the top of this thing with no danger of it floating around again but um through this whole ordeal it's been very difficult for us to understand where he is inside this contraption and in fact it's much smaller than i think a lot of us thought it was now that we have the perspective of, of adult men around it we realized there wasn't a lot to this thing I mean, this is a very very small craft and da and that's something that, that we heard in the news conference lester and david from the authorities the family said it was a very small compartment and we see other than a small child who could fit in something uh, that tiny there. Yeah, I, I, you know, watching it in the air all this time, it looked like it, you know, it was the size of a house, um, and and it's so tiny there. But I, but the other thing was is fascinating is that the the. Uh, the cockpit or whatever you call it remained attached because we heard in that news conference um, the concern that it was not attached very well. The family had expressed this, this fear that it was not firmly attached. And the fact that it stayed intact as this balloon came down, um, I think, gives us again more hope. Uh, but right now they're just trying to, it's like they're not, they're not obviously worried about the helium, just trying to get the, uh, the helium out of there and collapse it. Susan, uh, you're st still with us as well. I know you said you've never seen an aircraft like this, but uh, do you have any perspective to lend on what is happening here? Well, I think they're just trying to deflate it to make sure it doesn't go back up and then to find a way to extract that little guy and see if he's okay. okay. Is there any danger, Susan, when you're dealing with helium as far as that helium that may be left in the, that could seep into the basket or into that compartment? I don't think, I mean, from my knowledge, I don't think that that's a danger, but I'm not an experienced gas pilot, sorry. We're watching, David and Lester, and I'm sure you saw this as well, they kind of move that attachment around. Um, the reports were that the child was in here. This was his brother uh, reportedly saw him go inside, but we've seen no real movement toward that attachment as they've deflated the, the, the mushroom part, if you will, of this experimental aircraft completely. So now one, one wonders, they are now moving closer to the attachment, and you see some uh, movement there, David, with the shovel around the attachment. They're kind of hitting yeah. it. And Tamara, I want to interrupt just because I just heard from Megan. Apparently, KUSA, their photojournalist, is uh, on the scene, is saying that uh, there was nobody in uh, this compartment, uh, that the compartment uh, is empty, uh, which would explain then, um, I suppose, the way Why that they're, they're handling, handling this it. and trying to officially um, sort of verify that. And then that gets obviously to the uh, a couple of questions. Um, is it did the did the boy fall out um, along the way, or um, is this part of some sort of hoax or some sort of yeah. effort at attention by the family that a, a lot of people are already suggesting is kind of a strange family to begin with? Let's, let's listen, listen to KUSA's right. coverage. Right now, he's using his pocket knife to cut the rest of that open. That door is what you say was the door is open at this point. They're cutting the rest of the balloon open at this point. Um, but again, there is a. There's no child in this uh, in this balloon, and uh, to, to be honest with you, the, the faces of these uh, the paramedics and the and the sheriff's department are is in pretty much disbelief at this point. Um, a lot of phone calls are being made, and uh, just really no one uh, no one knows what to do right now. I can tell you that the bottom of the balloon there is a peg that was that's sticking out from the bottom of that um, balloon and there's nothing attached to it and it looks like at one point there something may have been attached to that but uh, again there is no child that is on this uh, that was a part of this uh, aircraft per se that landed in this field uh, completely dirt field out in the middle of Weld County just uh, east of 
Road 59 and south of uh, Road 6. And again, uh, the officers here on scene are, are just in complete uh, disbelief of, uh, of what they have uh, not found on this, uh, this aircraft. And as I walk around a little bit, I can definitely, uh, I can see that the bottom of this was made out of cardboard. And that door that you were referring to, to is a, a cardboard door. And it is uh, sitting there open. But uh, again, there's, there's no child here. When I first arrived on scene, I got here right as it was landing. Officers ran up to it, um, tethered it down with a rope. And then they, uh, at that point, then they started pitchforking it um, to deflate to the deflate the, uh, the aircraft, and then they were using a shovel to puncture holes in it as well. Um, they were yelling. Officers were yelling at the at the child in case he was inside, not to be scared. That it was authorities that were here to help him. But again, uh, I don't uh, tread. should mention the fact that um, authorities okay. did search the, the Henny home just on the off chance that his father mistakenly thought that he was inside the aircraft and they did not find a sign of him around the home, uh, which is probably important to note at this point as we find out that he was not inside the, the capsule. And Adam Chodak is the one who's been reporting from the family's home for us throughout the late morning and early afternoon. Let's go back to Adam now, who I believe is standing by with a neighbor. Adam. Right, Kyle. This is uh, Mark Friedland. He's a neighbor uh, of uh, Falcons. Um, so, so Mark, if you could uh, uh, first, I, I just, I just heard uh, they didn't find uh, a body. They didn't find Falcon well, in the basket. Oh. So, I don't know roughly that um, uh, any thoughts at this point? Uh, I mean, that's. I don't even know. I don't even. I don't even know how to react to that. I don't, I don't have a feeling yet with that. No, I, I don't think I can. I don't think my. I can I can have a feeling about that yet, but I mean obviously our you know our thoughts and our prayers and our are are you know for for you know Richard and and Mayumi and and the boys, and you know that's that's our our major main concern for them. Uh, you know I mean those they've been our neighbors for a year. We moved here about a year ago, and uh, they've been you know excellent you know good great friends and neighbors and uh you know they're slightly unusual yes you know they're you know scientists slash inventor you know storm chasers you know that's that's their lifestyle and um you know so they're not the typical neighbors to have but we've you know we we love them i mean they're they're great so what what is falcon like uh you know all the all the boys seem to be you know uh very uh well adjusted uh you know fun-loving uh, boys that are seem to, uh, you know, we get along with them. I mean, you know, we we sort of consider them part of we our... We are you know, listening to a neighbor of the Henny family react to the news that uh, this helium aircraft came down to the ground and no one, right, no one, including the six-year-old boy believed to be inside, was inside the aircraft. Still with me, Lester Holt, Susan Campbell. Uh, Lester, I'll start off with you here. Now this is still an investigation. The home of this family has been searched. Uh, it, it, this is uh, absolutely baffling at this point. Well, I, I have to tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm still feeling a sense of dread because we only know what we know, um, that he wasn't in the balloon when it landed. Oh. None of us saw it go up, so we're not even sure if we were watching the full structure of that balloon over these last uh, this last hour or so. The family had talked about uh, the, the passenger compartment, if you will, wasn't firmly attached. So, you know, there's a part of me, a large part of me, that wonders if, if perhaps he was on the balloon oh. and fell out, jumped out, perhaps, uh, you know, we don't know. We but, don't. Um, I'm, I'm not feeling that sense of relief that everything's okay here. I don't think any of us can until, until we, we get to the bottom of, uh, of some more questions here. And to backtrack a bit, uh, according to authorities, uh, Falcon and his brother were out in the back of the home. It was the brother who reported seeing Falcon climb into the compartment, and it's unknown how the tethered aircraft took off. Uh, the father saying that there was no clear explanation on how this took place. We don't know 
the timeline between when Falcon's brother uh, says he went inside or witnessed this and when he informed his parents uh, of seeing his brother, the six-year-old, go inside the compartment itself. But back to Susan. I mean, I know, Susan, you're not familiar with this kind of aircraft, but Lester makes the excellent point there that we don't know the full attachment if there was another part, uh, if Falcon was inside that portion. It, it's still a mystery at this uh, minute. Exactly. As uh, you know, we only came in on the second half of the story. The beginning of the flight, we didn't see. So that is disconcerting. Our, our, our assumption was the, the child was on board. And as a parent, as I saw the balloon gently land into the, the best scenario, I was uh, ecstatic. But um, now it's the, the rest of the story, you know, what happened at the beginning. Um, and uh, the, I guess the, the mystery is still uh, unfolding. I guess the one thing I should I, one thing I think we should point out, Tamron, is that I, I, I think there's a pretty good sense that the family, which has been working on this balloon for some time, I have a feeling, Tamron, that at least the father probably knew when, with some of the tight shots that we were showing and that others were showing on TV, whether that compartment was missing. Right. So the key now, of course, is going to be over the last hour or so, uh, what have they been able to learn from the family about this um, extra compartment that may have been missing? Uh, how much effort would it have taken for a six-year-old boy to try to pry himself loose? Is there any chance that it happened at a low enough altitude that maybe in some miraculous fashion he survived? And then, of course, the other big question, which is still out there, is are they absolutely convinced, are investigators absolutely convinced the boy was in there, that this wasn't part, some part of some grand scheme or hoax? And we heard the sheriff <laughs> earlier saying that, yes, they were convinced, they were sure uh, that the boy was in there, at least when this thing took off. But I'm sure they're going back again and re-asking the questions and just trying to be absolutely sure. Right, because you have one witness who is a child. We don't know the age of the second uh, a child who witnessed it, but uh, they were out of school today. School is not in session, and that's uh, the explanation of the boys being home at the time, given by the family, obviously. And uh, you've got one witness to this, and that would be the brother here. And I know the authorities are at the home, and they've uh, searched this home, David. So many of the answers, perhaps, are, as you point out, still with the Henny parents. Yeah, and let's bring uh, back uh, Lester in. Uh, Lester, this idea of, uh, of a compartment that might have been attached to this, I mean, obviously we're waiting to get more information from reporters or on the scene of the family to see what they've been able to divine about what this thing looked like originally. Um, but uh, again, it is quite possible that even a six-year-old boy who might be panicked at a certain point, if the bottom is made out of cardboard, that doesn't require a lot of strength to be able to create a hole or wedge yourself out of it. Yeah, and that's the thing. At one point, I can't see it now. We can see what appeared to be the hatch or the door on it. And what I don't know, and I, and I heard the uh, uh, KUSA cameraman describing the scene, it was, un it was unclear whether the door was, was open when it came down or if the rescuers had had opened it. It's, um, it's a disturbing story on a lot of levels, disturbing on the off chance that maybe this thing was, was one horrible mistake or hoax, and disturbing in the other that we can't, if we can't account for a child here. Um, you're right that the, the, the family would have been able to see the video, but, you know, it was spinning. Um, uh, I assume that all the parts appeared to be attached, but it's, it's that critical time between when it left the ground and when we first started seeing it on TV uh, is the difficult thing here. And if it was loosely attached, Attached, if it was easy to get open, it's not inconceivable that uh, he may have uh, made a leap to safety and, and hopefully uh, is okay somewhere near his home. And we heard uh, Lester and David, the uh, neighbor, describe the Henny family as scientists, inventors. He said they were unusual. Those were his words. Uh, and they were into a number of different things, including, obviously, this experimental aircraft. Their children would have been around this. It, as uh, the reporter on the ground pointed out, their backyard was pretty small. And this would take up much of the backyard, having something like this uh, in the rear of their home. But uh, we're waiting to get any update from the authorities who are still on the scene. Perhaps they will shortly give more information on what but Richard Henney, that is the father, and he was said to be on the phone in contact with experts who could give advice on how to bring down the aircraft when we were in the heart or the heat of this story. But we've not had an update uh, since the landing of that aircraft, David. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, we're still waiting for uh, for more information about uh, what the family is saying and, and how they're describing this um 
this sort of flying saucer. Uh, uh, Tamron, there, again, I, the other disturbing part is never mind, of course, that uh, a six-year-old boy is, assuming the family's being completely honest, and right now there's no indication that they're not, but in addition to sort of their six-year-old boy being missing and obviously everyone fearing the worst, uh, there are a lot of concerns about the family itself and, and things that have been posted by the family and by some of their friends in the sort of a circle of, of people who are involved in storm chasers and metaphysics and science. Uh, there are claims that the family believed in psychics. There are claims that the father felt that he was close to figuring out some sort of anti-gravity machine that might work in cyclones or in tornadoes. Uh, I mean, they certainly have been described as sort of a mad scientist type of family um, and how that translates into what it was they were trying to build here, how sturdy it was, and whether it was ever really intended to have anybody uh, attached to this thing. Right. Um, I mean, a lot of questions. There are, and I think what uh, Lester, you pointed out, one of the most critical things at this point is the timeline of when that uh, the report came in from the uh, brother of the missing boy that he saw, witnessed uh, Falcon, the six-year-old, get inside of that aircraft and when he told his family. There's a lot of missing time here that the authorities surely will have some information for us shortly because this has turned into a national story. People are watching this video all across the country. I'm sure even now with uh, viral videos in the internet, this is across the world and this is a mystery. You still have a six-year-old boy unaccounted for at this minute. Well, well, now the question has become a little more pointed. I mean, good investigative techniques. It, it sounds like they immediately searched the house to make sure he wasn't around there. Now that they know they have an empty balloon, the questions become harder. And perhaps the search expands beyond just the house itself. Um, the, the, you know, the questions of the brother, the family uh, become a little more directed now as they, as they try to figure out, establish, how do you know he was on here? Could he have run off? Um, how could he have escaped? How was this thing constructed? Uh, um, what's the area around here? Is there a nearby pond? Were there trees you might have tried to jump into? I mean, uh, now now it takes on a whole different tone. The, 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 the balloon we see lying in that field now is really irrelevant to this right. investigation. It's what happened before that point. And Tamron, we want to show for our viewers, again, at the end of this two-hour uh, journey of this uh, device, it, it did come down to a much sort of softer uh, landing that a lot of people had feared it would, and the kind of landing that... If there had been somebody inside, one might assume uh, they might have been able to survive this. Um, of course, the problem is, is that after two hours of drama about whether this balloon would land safely or not, or in a, any sort of position whereby somebody could survive, uh, unfortunately, they discovered fairly quickly that um, there was nobody inside um, that contraption. And there are reports that uh, a piece of the bottom part beneath uh, the bags that, that was made out of cardboard had somehow either been detached or came off, which then uh, raises uh, all kinds of questions about whether the boy um, fell out or whether he struggled at some point and it became detached uh, and where is he? Right. Um, that is the that is the question at this point. Where is Falcon Henny? Uh, the father described this as a family project that they've been working on. We don't have Lester and David a timeline on how long they've been working on this or any of those details. But as uh, Lester pointed out, that's almost irrelevant at this point. As uh, we've got to get more details, or the authorities there certainly are looking to get more details on a timeline and where this child could be right now. And uh, uh, Cameron? Yes. Uh, you know, the one thing we have to we have to point out is you watch that balloon, and, and I hate to paint this horrible picture, but that balloon was oscillating uh, for quite a while there. There was a lot of movement going on. Uh, the cameras and those helicopters were on a very long lens, but they were they were back a long way. So, so keep in mind, you know, we may have witnessed. Uh, you know, something and not even realize we were witnessing yeah. it along the way here because there was a lot of, especially in the last you know, 20 minutes, there was a lot of um, violent pitching of that balloon as, as it lost helium. Um, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just saying that really everything is open to a possibility here now, especially if that passenger compartment was flimsily attached or constructed, if the door wasn't attached. Um, we, we just don't know. Yeah, and we just got confirmation, David, here that, and this is something that had been floating around on the Internet, this family had been featured on a reality television show called Wife Swap last year. 
uh, where they profile the Henny family and what they say was the a lifestyle they live that's not for everyone. That's the quote. The life they live is not for everyone, but it, this Fort Collins family participated in this ABC reality show, Wife Swap. So we're learning a lot more about this family and, and who they are and their background as we wait to get any word on where uh, six-year-old Falcon is. He was five at the time, David and Lester, that they shot this uh, reality show with the family. Right, and Tamron, here's uh, some of us, since we've confirmed, uh, since the confirmation about him being on Wife Swap has been confirmed, uh, the original source to us about this, here's what else uh, he writes. Um, he writes, I've... He writes, I have known Richard for 20 years. He is an amazingly creative human, now turned mad scientist, who insists on repeatedly proving that there is a very fine line between genius and insanity. It's impossible to paint a true picture of Richard for you. I can tell you about the Cocker Spaniel. He gave a purple mohawk in the 80s and pronounced a punker spaniel. Uh, I could tell you about how impressed my son Jimmy was when at age 10 I took him to visit Richard in the abandoned house he was occupying. Jimmy was especially taken with the boarded up windows and the Mickey Mouse cartoon graffiti on the interior walls. I mean, it, it just, Tamron, when you, when you go through this, the people who claim to know Richard Haney and his family, I mean, paint this picture of some really... I don't know how you describe it, unusual beliefs, an unusual lifestyle. And, yeah, this is the family picture we're showing right now. This is uh, Mayumi, that is the mother. We heard the uh, neighbor refer to Richard. And originally they said that there were two sons. According to this uh, report I have in front of me, there are three, Bradford, Rio, and Falcon, the missing child being the youngest. And I imagine he would be the one in the middle on this photograph because according to the ages, and again, this is from a script from this reality show from last Last year at the time, Bradford was nine, Rio was seven, and Falcon was five. So he, uh, from looking at the picture and using logic, would be the small child in the middle there. And just just to be clear, I mean, regardless of what their interests were, assuming Tamron, as, as everyone does, including the police right now, that the boy was in that basket, that was not supposed to happen. This yeah. basket was not supposed to fly away with any of the kids on board. Clearly, the basket was uh, still a work in progress. And regardless of what the family believed about this contraption, um, if the child was on board, as everyone assumes that they were, you can imagine, Tamron, that they are as heartbroken and devastated Absolutely. by this series of developments as as anybody. Absolutely. You are spending your day with your children home from school. And according to uh, the reports from authorities there on the scene, the one son, and we don't know the identity of which boy, ran into the family and said that Falcon, the six-year-old, had crawled into the compartment and that for some unknown reason at this time, uh, the, the aircraft took off. It had been tethered in the rear of the home, the same long rope uh, uh, pieces that we saw when this helium aircraft was floating through the sky is what was used to tether it in the family's backyard and and there's no according to the authorities no clear explanation of how it became untethered uh, in the backyard david and Tamron, since we're, um, we're getting close to the top of the hour, we're going to uh, remind everybody of, uh, of what's been happening. On the left of your screen, you're looking at pictures of what uh, all of us were watching for about uh, an hour and a half, and that is the reports came in that uh, a, a, a helium balloon type of device uh, that was made to look like a flying saucer had somehow become untethered from a home in Fort Collins, Colorado, a home that was owned by Richard Haney, who was described, um, the father described as a storm chaser who had a fast fascination uh, with all sorts of uh, devices and storm chasing devices and science um, and the description was that um, this helium balloon had been tethered that one of the children one of the Haney children